Watch lead nav. Um, we are coming off bottom for another short period for some more testing. Thanks. Um, okay, so we are still having some problems with our ship. So as a result, we are pulling off the seafloor again. This is so that, you know, if anything were to happen with the ship, our vehicles would not be close enough to the seafloor that, that, that they would be dragged into any um, large structures and damaged. So as a result, we're going to continue to hang out in the midwater for a um, little bit of time. But I do think that Chuck is going to tell us about, you know, the history of deep sea exploration, which should be really interesting. So um, do keep... Do stay tuned, sorry, um, for that wonderful story, as well as any midwater animals that we may spot. Thank you very much, Diva. Um, one of the things that I've been interested in over the years is the history of deep sea exploration, because for most of human history, uh, nothing was known about the, uh, anything about the ocean below the surface. It was all a function of navigation and uh, coastal ahead, fisheries. Arby. So um, if we go back a ways, uh, Diva pointed out one wonderful job, quote Arby. from me, which proved um, not prophetic at all. In um, the first century of uh, the modern era, uh, A.D., Pliny the Elder, the Roman um, writer and naturalist, said, By Hercules, in the sea and in the ocean, vast as it is, there exists nothing that is unknown to us. Talk about a bit of an overstatement. We can't even say that today. Uh, but it wasn't until, well, basically a millennium and a half later, um, that the first attempt was made, Fernando Magellan, on his circumnavigation of the world, of the ocean, uh, from uh, Spain back to Spain, uh, he attempted the first deep sea sounding in the mid Pacific, let out all of the sounding line that he could, and found Did no bottom. And pretty much nothing well, else so happened fish. about deep sea exploration for another couple of centuries. Um, it wasn't until uh, the 19th century, actually, that um, things began to move. Uh, in the 1830s, the German Max Ehrenberg um, began his work on marine microorganisms, and he recognized the skeletons of microorganisms such as diatoms, and there go some tina four. No, those are salps. Those are salps. They're related to the pyrosome that we saw before, but they are solitary. Okay. They're like little barrels with hoop muscles that drive them through the water to filter the fine plankton. And they have a bizarrely complex life history of sexual and asexual right. reproduction and budding long chains of mini salps that separate from the parent. So Ehrenberg recognized the skeletons of many microscopic planktonic organisms like diatoms and foraminiferans in terrestrial okay. rocks and suggested that such rocks were still being formed on the sea floor. And there is a chain of salps, three salps linked together as one part of their life cycle. So that was in 1836. Then, Could you see me on high pack? Uh, no. not too much longer after that, uh, Edward Forbes, who came from the Isle of Man, was part of a British surveying expedition. Yeah. And it's important to note that yeah. throughout the much of the first half of the 19th century, uh, the British, as part of Britannia Rules of the Waves, sent out numerous surveying expeditions to better uh, map the coastlines yeah. of yeah. the entire world. You know famous explorers like James Cook, 
for example. But there were, in many cases, in the majority of cases, there was somebody along who was, uh, they didn't use the term scientist back then. And there's a small, oh, that's one of those jellies that has just a single tentacle. I believe that's what that is. Either that or it, no, that's, I think, a salp. That's a salp trailing a... Uh, a line of small buds or something similar. Yeah, that's another salp, a solitary planktonic sea squirt, S-A-L-P. And you can see the rib-like, uh, barrel hoop-like muscles that contract and drive these, these guys through the water. So the British sent out all of these surveying expeditions, and in addition to mapping coastlines, they uh, began to take uh, samples of the seafloor to find out how deep it was, how close to shore. And those expeditions brought naturalists aboard along. There's another salp. Um, Darwin was one of them. That was a um, surveying expedition. There's a tina four, a comb jelly. That may be the same. That's a low bait. I can't quite tell from this angle if it's Euramphaea or not. And it's just hanging out. So every expedition brought along a naturalist. That's what they called scientists back then. And Darwin was one of them. The Voyage of the Beagle was primarily a surveying expedition. People usually called Darwin a naturalist on board. There's a pyrosome, one of the colonial planktonic sea squirts related to the salps. But one of Darwin's, also one of Darwin's jobs, if you want to call it that, on the Beagle was to be the uh, companion to the captain because, of course, that was a very class-conscious society. And the captain I mean, uh, just, uh, frequently didn't want to socialize with no members of the and lower the orders of the port. crew. So Darwin was on board being a uh, member of a similar uh, social class in addition to his duties as a uh, naturalist. And, of course, we all know where that led. So other scientists, went, other naturalists went on other expeditions. Thomas Henry Huxley was on the rattlesnake uh, George Wallach was on the Bulldog, and a fellow named Edward Forbes was on an expedition, a uh, surveying expedition in the Aegean Sea between Turkey and Greece. And the British Iron Association Average, for the Advancement of Science had established a committee for researchers with the dredge to investigate the marine zoology of British waters. But, of course, the opportunities arose to go further afield. And Manx, uh, rather Manxman, um, Edward Forbes, took a dredge along in the Aegean. And he dredged um, in successively deeper water and discovered that the deeper he went, the less he found. The fewer organisms, the fewer kinds of organisms. Yeah, we're going to come and off the bottom. We're come out of there was a depth beyond which no life could exist in the ocean, or that it would not be very much in the way of life. Uh, subsequently, that well, that was published in 1854 after his death. Subsequently, people took that and said absolutely no life could exist in the ocean. They called it the Azoic zone, the zone of no life. And that's how things stood for quite a while. In addition, People thought that because of the increasing density of seawater with the great pressure in the deep sea, things that fell into the ocean would not necessarily sink to the bottom, but would sink to a level at which their density, the object's density, would match the density of seawater. So, for example, later this idea persisted in the uh, public mind so some people were worried, for example, when Titanic sank, sank that the uh, bodies of the un unfortunates would not reach the sea floor, but would float for perpetuity in the midwaters. Well, of course, that's not the case. In any case, 
Forbes Azoic Zone held for a while, despite the fact that before he published that, several other survey expeditions, James Clark Ross, for example, there was a siphonophore that drifted by. Uh, James Clark Ross, um, uh, let me see if I've got my expeditions correct here. Um, surveyed in the, uh, let's see if I can remember where it is, John Ross collected some small living organisms with a uh, deep sea a device called a CLAMM, C-L-A-M-M, -M, that he referred to it, uh, from 2,000 meters down in Baffin Bay in the North Atlantic. But his results were published in a naval journal, as I think an appendix, and nobody paid any attention to it. Uh, there was no internet back then, of course. But interest in the deep sea grew in the middle of the 19th century because of what was to become the mid-19th century version of the internet, and that was the transoceanic telegraph cables, which would link communications between the old world and the new world. And that was a very high priority. The first one across the Atlantic uh, was uh, laid in the 1850s, but it failed. And uh, another one was finally laid in the 1860s. So in developing this, um, people were extremely interested in finding out how deep the ocean was, where it was shallow, where it was deep, where it was rocky, where it was muddy. So there were all of these surveys that went out and uh, took samples of the deep sea floor, mostly very small samples of sediment. One of the interesting things that popped up from that was that those deep sea samples included the shells of microscopic organisms. And there was a big argument about whether those shells were created by organisms on the deep sea floor indicating that life could exist in the deep sea, or did those shells belong to little organisms of the plankton that lived near the surface and drifted down to the sea floor when they died? So this was a bit of a bone of contention. But the Azoic Zone was still uh, pretty much in force at this time until people started dredging in deep Army water. And one of the people that dredged in yeah, just let you know, um, right named named now our vector is George heading to starboard. Um, George Wallet was on a survey uh, expedition to aboard the here, Bulldog uh, across the North Atlantic. And they did soundings. And in one area, they took three successive soundings with a weight to, to so determine how deep the sea was. Hey guys, this was off the coast of Iceland. And on the third sounding, they let the line pay out much longer than the depth that they had recorded on previous soundings, so that there was line coiled along the sea floor. When they brought that line up, clinging to near the base of the line was about a dozen brittle stars. And while it concluded correctly that this was firm evidence that life could indeed exist on the deep sea floor. Of course, Wallach was a bit of an outsider, and uh, the rest of the naturalist community sort of poo-pooed his findings. He also uh, decided to downplay the discovery of the Rosses from uh, previous expeditions. And his writing was amazingly convoluted. So let me give you a quote. And I'm going to dare, despite my sitting next to Diva here, I'm going to attempt uh, something of a British accent, if you don't mind. But the writing back then was incredibly convoluted sometimes. So here we go. This is George Wallach writing in the early 1860s. On no question connected with marine zoology does the information of naturalists appear to have been so singularly defective as on the bathymetrical limit of animal life in the ocean. When it is borne in mind that until a very recent period but a few isolated attempts had been made to bring up 
some specimens of bottom from deep water, and that the antibiotic view rested exclusively on the foregone conclusion that no organized creature of a kind analogous to those with which we are acquainted could exist under the extraordinary conditions of pressure, aeration, temperature, and light which prevail on the deep sea bed, it can hardly be wondered at the at that, the clearest proofs should have been necessary in order to establish an opposite opinion. I can take a breath. And so you can see that was a bit of a run-on sentence. I would never allow one of my students to, uh, to write like that. He referred to the antibiotic view, the against life view, which was the equivalent of the azoic zone. So... That was sort of the standing, and then also around the same time, a Norwegian naturalist named Michael Sars and his son, Georg, uh, did some dredging off the coast of Norway, off the Lofoden Islands in the north of Norway, and from deep water, very deep water, they dredged a small lily-like creature, or thing that looked like a little palm tree, just a few inches tall, um, that they named Rhizocrinus lofotensis. It was a sea lily, and as far as anyone knew at the time, this kind of sea lily had been extinct since the Mesozoic. So this was really one of the first supposed deep-sea living fossils. And this generated enormous interest because just a few, min a few years earlier, Darwin had published on the origin of species. And, of course, his concept of his hypothesis of natural selection said that organisms with, will evolve in response to a changing environment. Well, the corollary, of course, is that if the environment doesn't change or changes very little or slowly, organisms will not evolve as much. So here we have the deep sea, which is supposedly a an unchanging environment, and lo and behold, here is a supposedly living fossil, an organism that has remained unchanged for millions of years in the deep sea. Well, this got a lot of people very interested. And initially, of course, the uh, Azoic zone went away, but it w had gone away actually a couple of years before for a, a different reason, which I'll mention in a minute. But the discovery of the supposed living fossil got a lot of people oh, I mean, very it's, interested. It's Maybe there were the trilobites in the deep sea. sea. Who knew? So two, two head over to about one Englishmen zero. in particular, Charles Wyville Thompson, uh, who was at the University of Edinburgh, so maybe I'm a little hasty in calling him an Englishman. I'm not sure where he was born. And W.B. Carpenter, who was vice president of the Royal Society, got together and they petitioned the British Admiralty for a ship to explore the deep sea. And they had a series of smaller ships. One was the Lightning, one was the Porcupine, and both of them discovered life in the deep sea. And they were successful enough that Carpenter and Thompson petitioned the Admiralty for a better ship, and they got HMS Challenger. And in eight, from December of 1873 to 1876, Challenger sailed around the world and created the benchmark beginning of modern deep sea biology and oceanography. A couple of sideline stories. The Azoic zone had been um, the prevailing idea, but one of those Deep sea cables, it was a cable, a telegraph cable, that ran between the island of Sardinia and Tunisia in North Africa. And in, I believe, 1861, it was brought up for repairs and was found encrusted with all sorts of life deep sea coral, bryozoans, mollusks. And so that was when the Azoic zone really went poof. The other thing that was interesting was also around this time, Thomas Henry Huxley, who was another naturalist and one of Darwin's friends, was a uh, naturalist on board HMS Rattlesnake. And the deep sea sediment that he brought back, he examined later on, uh, 
and saw under the out. microscope what he identified as the primordial ooze, perhaps from which all life had arisen. The idea, again, that ancient life could still exist on the deep sea floor. And uh, he named it Bethebius, Deep Life, Haeckeli, after Ernst Haeckel, the great German naturalist. Well, this was an interesting idea. You had the living fossil Rhizocrinus, supposedly living fossil. You had Bethebius, perhaps the primordial ooze covering the deep sea floor. Like is at 100, they're but aiming for 90, just 100. to uh, end things up, it turns yeah. out right. that uh, the sea lily is actually a, uh, has re has relatives that go back to the Cretaceous, but it's uh, it's a stretch to call it a living fossil. But Bethebius was an interesting story because aboard the Challenger, Are the chemist this, aboard uh, the Challenger uh, examined deep sea sediments, and of course they preserved the them. them. And it turns, turns out that Bethebius haeckeli was actually a sort of um, Center rotations What's the word I'm I am still maintaining of, the sway uh, mixture the of the uh, chemical mixture of the preservative they used and the deep sea sediment that formed this sort of flocculent ooze, and it wasn't the primordial ooze of life. It was just a chemical uh, mixture. And Huxley, being the uh, brilliant and uh, uh, brilliant scientist that he was, Ad admitted immediately that he had been wrong, that Bethebius haeckeli was not a living organism. Around the same time, also, uh, the American scientist, actually the Swiss scientist, Louis um, Agassiz, who had um, emigrated to the U.S. and set up shop at Harvard, did some of the first deep-sea dredging along the coast of the U.S., particularly along the coast of Florida. And from that point on in the 1860s exploration of, and 1870s exploration of the deep sea really took off with numerous uh, nations sending out expeditions around the world, Germans, the French, the Italians, and so on, and the Americans. And I'll wrap